Welcome to Embedded. I am Elysia White, here with Christopher White. Our guest this week is Professor Leah Beakley. We're going to talk about machines and hands and art. Hello, Professor Beakley. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Uh, Thank you for having me. Could you tell us about yourself as if this was the first day of classes? Sure. So my name is Leah Beakley. Uh, I do research and explorations kind of at the intersection of computer science and electronics and really design and craft. Um, I'm also very interested in education. And so the work that I do tends to take place at the intersection of all of those things. And it's easiest to talk about with props, um, <laughs> but we'll, we'll do the best we can. Yeah. Audio only is tough for props. Okay. We want to do lightning round where we ask you short questions and we want short answers. And if we're behaving ourselves, we won't ask how and why and all of that. Are you ready? Uh, ready. Science or engineering? Engineering. Art or craft? Craft. Favorite artist? Uh, Andrea Ziddle. Hardware or software? Hardware. Uh, What's your preferred way to learn new things? Reading, videos, trying it out until you make it work? (laughs) Doing it, for sure. Favorite fictional robot? Ooh, I'm going to pass on that one because I can't answer quickly. Doesn't like any robots. Uh, (laughs) Complete one project or start a dozen? Oh, complete one project for sure. Can an image created by an AI be art? Yes. And I want to keep talking, but I'm going to resist the temptation. (laughs) Maybe we can come back to that. Uh, Tip everyone should know. Don't be afraid to copy the work of other people as a great way to get started. I like that. There used to be these painting schools that that's what they did. They copied the old masters. And we seem to be so afraid of copying other people's ideas in order to get that experience for ourselves. It's it's weird. Yeah, no, you can learn so much and it can, I think it's, we are too afraid of copying and pretty naturally you end up doing your own thing so yeah it's hard to actually copy yeah you know it's hard to be somebody else for any extended period of time your your own weirdness just takes over pretty quickly so going back to can ais make art yeah so i would expand that and say that the context in which that is happening is really critical and what is um, I think what computation brings to art and design is in large part the power to build kind of entire classes or entire families of kind of related things. And so in that context, I think both the the output of you know an art AI would constitute like would would be comprised of more than just a single image. It would be the code. It would be probably a whole family of images and kind of a larger body of work than like a single painting, for example, that I would want to see before I would call anything like that art. Um, and, And again, kind of the context and the intent are important there too. Um, So, yeah. So with some asterisks, um, but the answer is a definite yeah, yes, um, with some expansion. Do you want to follow up on that? Because you were the one playing well, with the game. Yeah, it just it just came to mind. That's the reason I put that in there. Was I was I've been following people who are using uh, a neural network system called Clip and something GAN. I'm going to space it. We'll put it in the show show notes. It's like VQ GAN or something. But you can go in and you can type a, a prompt and it'll go through and using its various things it's been trained on, it'll generate images and they, they can be very surreal, weird images. And some, and things I've tried to do with it come out as just kind of like bad dreams, 
but I've seen other people who are more skilled at prompting it come out with things that actually look like, you know, paintings and, or yeah. very cool, um, haunting ethereal things and have an emotional response to it. And yet it just came out of this neural network and somebody just typed, you know, make a fancy surreal bookstore. So it, right. it's hard for me to call it art, but it's also, I had an emotional response to it. So how is right. it not? I, I'm a big fan of like the artist, uh, Natrice Gaskins. Um, actually she just came out with a new book. Um, it's techno vernacular creativity, I believe. And that, that I wrote a foreword for, but, um, she's, her work is a, I think a gorgeous example of how AI generated images really can rise to the, to the label of art. Um, like one lovely example. Cool. We'll have that in the show notes. Cool. Uh, okay, so your research group is called Hand and Machine. Why is it called that? Yeah, um, my career has really been about finding ways to bring a humanness and and a materialness to technology, and so that is kind of reflected in the name. I'm also very interested in, in exploring and kind of questioning these dichotomies that we often set up, like that the hand and machine would be so different or that they would be so much in opposition, I think is worth questioning. And so that provocation is also appealing and, and, and part of um, why I chose the term. Uh, not so different from the name of my previous research group, which was high low tech, um, embodying kind of some of the same ideas and, and some of the same style of approach. Did you switch the name as part of moving from MIT to University of New Mexico, or was there another another reason? Yeah, I mean, in large part, it felt like a fresh start in a really different context. So, um, all sorts of reasons, um, UNM is really, really different from MIT, and um, and it felt appropriate to kind of put the MIT work, which I'm so proud of and so I'm delighted with, and especially you know work that I got to do with my students there. But to kind of tie that in a bow and set it aside and start something like fresh and new. So so yeah, I wanted to to choose a new name and and have a, a distinct new start there. Boston and MIT particularly has a very enthusiastic engineering community. Um, New Mexico is more known for art. Do you see your surroundings affecting what you do? Absolutely. Um, so much so. Um, I think although in, in perhaps you know, often unexpected ways. One of the the things that's been wonderful about being in New Mexico, more so than I think the art community per se, has been the landscape and the materials that are readily kind of at hand, being able to spend a lot of time outside, um, a lot of time um, sinking and being in just dirt, for example. I've done a lot of kind of work around clay that I think is really related to that, just like being closer to like the dirt um, and also being much more involved in like being, like being able to do stuff like go hiking and backpacking and gardening and stuff um, has had a, a wonderful effect. So, so definitely the setting really matters and communities really matter, but, um, but in probably more subtle ways than, than just like art versus engineering in some sense. So talking about clay, I saw on your website something about computational ceramics. What could that yeah. possibly be? <laughs> right, right. So um, where, to, where to dive in? So I should say one of the ways in which I work is to become infatuated with a material. So textiles or paper or um, kind of more recently clay. Um and then just start to play with it and explore it and see ways in which I can bring my engineering expertise or my computational expertise to kind of to bear on on that material. Um, so the work in clay that I've been doing is is focused around computational design or algorithmic design in ways that kind of 
traditions and techniques from that community can be applied to clay and also how we can combine kind of cutting edge technology and computational approaches with longstanding traditions of working with clay. Um, so more concretely, um, I've done a lot of work around using the laser cutter um, to, for example, etch patterns into, into clay um, to create templates that you then press um, into clay to, to generate um, computationally des designed surface patterns. Also um, worked to create some software that lets you um, generate kind of computationally designed, essentially origami patterns, but for clay. Um, and then kind of the most recent development that I'm really excited about is we just got a ceramic 3D printer for my lab. So we're starting to write some custom software um, so that we can kind of gener computationally generate 3D forms that are then printed in ceramics. Um, and then once they're printed, I think and also a really critical part of the process is that you can use traditional ceramic techniques, kind of traditional crafting techniques um, in all sorts of ways to kind of um, take the next step of the process, or often you can integrate new and different computational processes at each step of kind of a traditional um, crafting process. So the, all of that is really exciting and interesting and, and something I'm having a lot of fun exploring right now. Um, I should also say on that topic that um, Jennifer Jacobs, who's one of my former students from MIT and is now a faculty member at UC Santa Barbara, that um, she and I just got an NSF grant to explore kind of computational design and ceramics, and and in particular some um, kind of traditional artisans who who work with clay, and to try to find interesting combinations um, at those intersections. So I'm really excited to start working on that project with with Jennifer. Also, is it about making the ceramics more aesthetically pleasing? Or are you also trying to make them stronger for less material? Yeah, not so much stronger for less material, although, um, but, but um, a couple of things I would say. One is that I think there is a tremendous amount that fabrication researchers can learn from traditional craftspeople about the possibilities of materials uh, about processes that are kind of off our radar, um, about just different kinds of materials that might be totally off our radar. So part of this is like learning from traditional craftspeople, kind of how they work with clay, some of the technologies, techniques, materials that they use, and using that to inform research on um, computational design and fabrication. Um, and just from my experience so far working with ceramics, there's like so much that you can learn from traditional craftspeople that's really applicable to like developing new technology. So that's one facet of it. And then the other facet is kind of the arrow going the other way, where when you use computation in the context of design, you open up just entirely new um, worlds of possibility. So you can use computation to generate shapes and patterns and structures that just you would never generate by hand. And, um, and so bringing those possibilities to kind of, um, to blend with traditional craft, um, is also really exciting, both aesthetically, potentially, um, functionally, although that's not, you know, we're not taking a, an especially kind of functionally oriented approach here, but it wouldn't be surprising if, if some of the results would end up being functional. Um, but yeah, just that conversation between those two traditions and those two perspectives is what, um, seems really exciting. What, what, can you give me a hands-on, like, what have you learned from an artisan that has uh, affected computational ceramics? Right, right. Sure. So one of the first things that I did is I created this whole kind of library of trying to bring together um, computational 
techniques and approaches with traditional ceramics. And so a traditional ceramic craft, um, one of the things that people have done with ceramics for a very long time is carve the surface of ceramics. Um, and then there are all sorts of traditional techniques that are based on kind of layering that carving with like um, different colors or clay, for example, to create all sorts of surface patterns and textures, but also like graphic effects. So you might kind of carve the surface of the clay, then paint it and, you know, then wipe away the excess paint so that the paint stays only in the areas where you carved it. Or conversely, you might paint something first, then carve it, right, to kind of create those um, opposite effects. And you can imagine layering these techniques in, in all sorts of interesting ways. So within the traditional ceramics world, there are all sorts of these established techniques for making marks on the surface of ceramics. When you combine that with the laser cutter, um, you can kind of add the power of computation to all of those traditional techniques. And instead of carving through using a traditional carving tool, you can carve using the laser cutter. You can play around with, um, you know, different layers of kind of glaze or underglaze to get um, really beautiful um, kind of graphical patterns in clay. You can play around with how in focus or out of the focus the laser cutter is to get um, dramatic kind of gradation effects. Um, so that expertise that comes like from the craft community can really inform things you choose to do with technology. And then what you're able to do with technology in turn is really different than what you're able to do by hand. And so there's this wonderful like back and forth that's really um, productive and interesting. I've done a little bit of ceramics and a little bit of the sagrafito carving. Yeah, sgraffito. Yeah, yeah. Sgraffito. And Mishima. And yes, you can like, yeah, all of those techniques. But I think the closest I came to anything computational was glaze generation and trying to right. do the chemistry of the glaze, mostly right, right. through trial and error and tree searches. <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, another thing that you learn as you explore any of these particular domains is that they're already, um, they're all quite technical and many of them are already quite computationally technical. So another place where computation is quite present already in, in traditional ceramics practice is like the, the um, kiln and the firing processes that, um, you know, the kiln goes through to to um, get exactly the right um, kind of temperature at exactly the right time. And so... Um, and air composition, whether you want oxygen or not. Right, 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 right. Um, so all of those things, like when you approach it as like a hacker, like there's so many possibilities. And that is a lot of what I love about these intersections. Is this... Is this about making things beautiful or interesting people in computer science or something else? Right. So I think it's, for me, it's many things um, at the same time. Mm -hmm. So beauty is always really important. Um, I think just um, beauty is, uh, is so important um, to all human beings. And it's something that... Um, it's easy in, for whatever reason, in our culture today to think of as like a trivial or frivolous thing. But I think it's actually just a core, really important um, human value and one that we should honor and, um, and take pride in. Um, anyway, so I think beauty is incredibly important to the human experience. And so, yes, beauty Um is, is critical there and, and something I wish that um, more people embraced um, and defended kind of. So, so beauty is, is, is really important. Um, technology and developing innovative technology is also really important. So I'm not so interested in doing stuff that doesn't involve really creating some piece of novel technology in some way. Um, 
also there's a kind of social cultural element to my work where I'm very interested in ex- kind of looking for um, inspiration in places that seem maybe forgotten or um, uh, underappreciated by society. Often that can mean turning towards um, technologies and materials that were traditionally used by women. Um, that's a whole source of like amazing stuff that has been historically kind of undervalued just because it was like stuff that women did or, um, and so, so bringing, um, kind of attention and celebration and acknowledgement to some of those spaces is another just aspect of my work that I enjoy and I think is important. Then kind of related to that is that when you can put technology in the context of a craft or an art or a design practice that has maybe been traditionally overlooked. Um, and often that's because again, that's been something that is done by a community of people. We don't pay a lot of attention to then very naturally there are wonderful ways to kind of engage different kinds of communities into kind of creating technology for themselves and, rethinking like the power that 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 people can get from um, building technology and designing technology and trying to make that power and status and and stuff accessible and inviting to more and different kinds of people so it's all like interconnected um but all those aspects are there i remember when fractal pictures started coming out in the 80s, 90s? It sort of started getting popular in the late 80s when and realize, computers could do yeah. something. <laughs> and and realizing that you could program that. And it yeah. wasn't really very hard to program something to get incredible, amazing images out. Well, they were incredible for then. Well, yes, they were incredible <laughs> for then. Now, you know, not even a GAN would bother with that. Look, this has four colors. <laughs> but yes, yes. I can understand how that sort of awe and beauty can bring people to technology to help them realize that those people who are a little afraid of the technology, it, it, it provides a bridge. Mm. You also do more fabrication. It's not just pretty pictures on screens. Not, 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 to, not to downplay pretty pictures on screens, because they're amazing. Um, right. But the fabrication is part of it for you. And that that's part of the building the new technologies, or is that just because the fabrication is what's interesting to you? Yeah, I think I think both. Um, I think personally I've always been drawn to I mean computing and like programming it, I find incredibly exciting and compelling. And then being able to take that into the physical world in some way, whether that's through building like electronics and hardware or whether that's through kind of having the code like generate something that then is like a physical object in the real world. Like that is is just kind of for me like extra exciting and compelling. And so I think. And there's also all sorts of, you know, really exciting, interesting, like new technology to develop in that space. Um, and so, so it's a mashup of those two things. But I think now that I know that there are ways to like make computation come alive in the real world off of the screen, um, yeah, it, it'd be hard for me to to move into working on projects that lived only on the screen. I, I just find the physical world like completely enchanting and, and fascinating. I totally agree. That's why I do embedded because the first time <laughs> I made a motor move and it was under my control, it was just magic. My bits can affect the actual physical world. How is that possible? Um, so yeah, I love that feeling. Yeah, totally. Totally. How do interactive murals fit into all of this? Yeah, so that's a totally different project that I'm also really excited about. Um, 
distinct from the ceramics. So that is a um, a project that I'm working on in collaboration um, with uh, well some wonderful students in my research group here um, at UNM, in particular Alicia Bustos, who's who's awesome. Um, and also an amazing mural artist named Nani Chacon. Um, and she, well, she just is an amazing painter. Uh, and this, this project, when I was at MIT, I did a series of projects around interactive wallpaper. So thinking about embedding kind of sensors and computation and um, actuators like um, lights and tiny motors and things like that kind of on very large um, indoor surfaces so that you could have these um, surfaces that were beautiful, like wall wallpaper and decorative, but also um, could monitor your environment, could, um, you know, do some tracking of like where you were in the space, um, could act as like a control for all of the other electronics in, in the room or in your home. Um, so thinking about, again, like a kind of ambient, kind of beautiful, large surface in your home that might function um, as an input-output uh, device. Um, those were made with um, prim primarily by painting, using conductive paint, kind of painting circuit boards onto either very large sheets of paper or directly onto walls to make these um, interactive wallpaper pieces. So that was a project that my students and I did at MIT, and it was really kind of fun and interesting. Um, when I came to New Mexico, again, in large part, I think because of the context and the culture here and the traditions, there's an amazing mural painting tradition um, in the Southwest and in particular in New Mexico. And so I thought, oh, I would love to do like a similar thing, um, it, but in the context of murals. And there's, you know, the technology in some sense is similar, but it's a lot harder because these things have to live outside um, in the elements. They're much larger um, than a wall in your houses. And then... Um, you can't hide the batteries in the frame. <laughs> yeah, there's not a lot of hiding of stuff. I mean, that was true of the of the wallpapers. That's true. To some extent also, but you could like, you know, you could plug it into your computer off to the side in a way that you can't really with like an outdoor mural. But then the like the interaction possibilities are also really different. So you murals are at a different scale than a home. So you get really far away from them and the, you know, more than you would a wall in your home. Cars drive past them. Um, you know, you inter they're in public spaces instead of private spaces. So that opens up all of these possibilities for like collaborative interaction. Anyway, so that has seemed all just like really exciting and interesting. And so um, Nani and um, and I and, and Alicia and some other students are painting like our first kind of very large scale um, interactive mural right now on the UNM campus. Um, again, using a crazy combination of conductive paints and um, tapes to have everything be just kind of flat and really integrated into the painting um, kind of playing around with both different themes and designs for the mural and also different, you know, interaction scenarios. Like, what do we want to do with this thing? And that was um, my next anyways, question. So, what does it do? Right. So right now we're, um, in the process of building it. So we have, um, some, uh, so they're embedded, lights in parts of it that are part of the display. We have some kind of color changing elements as well. Lots of painted on um, capacitive sensors that allow for um, kind of interaction through touch and also collaborative interaction. So um, to trigger certain behaviors, like I have to touch one part and you have to touch the other part at a certain time and that will trigger certain behaviors. We're just starting to play with some of um, some of those possibilities, like making games, for example, that you can play like on the mural across this very large wall. Um, a lot of it also just getting back to beauty is just like it's beautiful, I think. 
And the combination to me of the traditional mural painting and the like aesthetic of the electronics is really interesting. The look and feel of like conductive inks and, and tapes and stuff kind of integrated into this giant painting is really beautiful. Um, so we're playing with all of that. So stay tuned on that front. I don't know that I have a great like finished description yet, but, but we're having lots of fun. Is this related to your work with Chibitronics? In a roundabout way. So, um, yeah. So, uh, another paper that, or another <laughs> material that I became really infatuated with, like right around the time when I joined MIT was paper and thinking about ways to um, embed electronics into paper. And I did a lot of experiments with painting, with conductive inks and, and paints, um, kind of circuits on the pa paper, kind of developing different ways that we could embed electronics in paper. Um, right around that time, um, G. Chi um, joined my research group first as an undergraduate um, uh, visiting student, and then then as a as a PhD student shortly after. And she brought um, to the group and to the lab like this amazing expertise in paper. Um, she's been she had been working with paper for a very long time, and so um, G then. <laughs> just was like rocket fuel to like all of the paper explorations that we did in our lab. And she did all sorts of incredibly beautiful and imaginative and like groundbreaking things with kind of paper-based electronics. We, um, you know, collaborated on some of that stuff. A lot of it was really driven by, by the work that G did. Um, one of the, the outcomes of that is that G, um, kind of turned some of her developments into this kit for um, uh, paper-based computing called Circuit Stickers and um, a startup company called Chibitronics. Um, so that was like, that was really grounded in the work that we did in the group around like paper-based um, electronics and paper-based computing. Um, uh, so it was a joy to like be able to work with G and collaborate with G around some of that, some of that stuff. And I'm like, so proud of the work that she's done since, including her work um, in Chibitronics and designing circuit stickers with um, Bunny Huang and, and others. So that was, that was great. So I guess before that, you must have been interested in wearable technologies because you were involved with the development of the lily pad. How did that come about? Yeah. So um, I would say more, I was really I was infatuated and really interested in textiles and the materials of like fabric and yarn and um, kind of soft, flexible things. So really my PhD um, project was around developing a set of techniques for embedding electronics into textiles. And one outcome of that was um, um, designing the lily pad Arduino. Um, and then I was... Um, just right place, right time. Um, I got my PhD in Boulder, Colorado, right when SparkFun was starting up. So I mm -hmm. developed this technology and this board and I kind of took it to them and was like, hey, do you guys want to mass produce this and sell this? And they were like, yeah. And so we worked together and that was um, kind of how Lilypad came about. It was like this project that came out of my academic research, but uh, um, and then they were able to like commercialize and distribute. And that was, that's been a wonderful um, collaboration ever since. So. What do you wish someone had told you when you were starting that process? Gosh, that's a tricky one. I mean, one, one thing, maybe the biggest thing is like um, that I might tell myself at the start of that project is it like, it's okay to let go of a project and like move on to a new one and like, you know, let other people take it over at a certain point because, um, yeah, like it's good to let go of old projects to make space for like new ones. Um, yeah. So the lily pad got commercialized and then you were G's mentor at MIT while she was developing the circuit stickers. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. as you were watching that go into more of a professional commercial fabrication sort of thing, did you have advice for her? Was it very different? Was there a lot the same? Yeah. I mean, I think that was something we talked about and have talked about a fair amount, just, um, you know, and, and she, in there are, in certain ways, Chibitronics and like circuit stickers is modeled on the lily pad. Like it's a kit for constructing electronics in this different medium. It's this, you know, a set of um, components that, you know, were similar in many ways to like the set of components that lily pad offered. Um, so in, in a lot of ways, like lily pad maybe is kind of, was kind of at least an initial template for circuit stickers. I think then other choices were really different. So one thing that, that G did that was really different is that she and she worked with bunny and they started their own company as opposed to kind of offloading the, um, you know, the, the production and distribution onto a third party, like I did with spark fun, they really, they, um, had to deal with all of that stuff too. And I think that has benefits and drawbacks. It was a harder thing to do. Um, but then I think they also reaped some benefits from that. They had more fine tuned control over the design and, and so on. Um, so, so yeah, I think, um, you know, it's something that we'll still, um, talk about from time to time, just like, you know, what it's like to run a, a small kind of hardware business, what it's like when that business like evolves over time and changes and the whole context around like this, this thing that you did, you know, changes and, um, all of that is, is really interesting. And you like to think that like your project had a role in changing that larger context. And I don't know, it's interesting. Both of those projects have made a huge impact in making STEM more approachable through art, just making it more fun. Mm. What's coming up in the future? Do you have anything, any ideas of, are you watching anything that has the potential to be as much fun as lily pad or Tibitronics? Oh gosh, that's such an interesting question. Um, one thing I would say is like compared to like, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, I'm really, it's delightful to see just how many more things there are like that out in the hardware world and how much more like celebration of an acceptance of like these these, um, you know, non-traditional electronics, um, just how much more of, of appreciation of that there is. So I, I think there's all sorts of like beautiful and interesting stuff happening that really wasn't, you know, when I started out at all. Um, I think especially you see that in opportunities for young people. So it used to be that, you know, it was a just there was none of this really when I started working on Lily Pad Arduino. You couldn't get any of these materials. They were weird. Like the electronics was just kind of like snap circuits and that was it. So the the blossoming of all of these different creative things that you can do with electronics, I think is so wonderful and great. There I some the projects that I'm working on right now, I'm I'm having lots of fun. I think they're really exciting opportunities in computational design and fabrication. Um, you know, which is where I'm spending a lot of my time and energy these days. I think for better or for worse, that's a space where um, it's less amenable to like a, a kit um, that you like sell to somebody. Um, on the other hand, I think there are really exciting things that can be done in software to make those spaces more accessible and also to prompt people to think cr creatively about materials and tools and so on. Um, and certainly you see lots of that out there already. Um, but I think there are all sorts of possibilities there for more, more stuff along those lines too. Um, so I don't know. I, I think there's more fun for everybody like on the horizon, in, including my, myself. So that's good. Okay. You said origami like 45 minutes ago and mm -hmm. half the people who are listening are like, and she didn't even stop. And on your website, you, uh, on the hand and machine, machine in hand. Hand and machine, yeah. Hand and machine, it talks about paper and tiny machines. 
Now, I'm really into origami, especially weird origami with curves and mm. and snails. Um, so I need to know everything you can tell me about this. Yeah, so this stems from, um, in large part, the origin is I became uh, obsessed at, at a certain point with like teeny tiny motors. Um, I think they became like widespread because of um, digital cameras with little moving shutters, which are now kind of obsolete, but thankfully you can still get the motors. So you can get these teeny tiny stepper motors in particular that are like the size of your fingernail that are just, well, they're gorgeous. And, (laughs) and to me anyway, they suggest that you should put them into paper and make tiny little machines and tiny little mechanisms. Um, so I have a whole, like it's an eBay addiction to buy, uh, tons and tons of these motors. I have a whole bunch of them. And, um, this is a project that, yeah, has been a little bit on the back burner since COVID. Um, the last kind of interesting thing that, um, that I was able to do along those lines with is to, um, collaborate with a wonderful, um, researcher, uh, Hanju Oh, who's a, um, a professor at Georgia Tech now in, um, in the industrial design uh, department there. Um, we, we shared an academic advisor, um, Mike Eisenberg, so we became close that way. But she does amazing stuff with paper mechanics. And so we um, collaborated around kind of a building a set of mechanisms, seeing what these teeny little motors could do with paper um, and Um, so we, um, made a a kind of a library of these little mechanisms, like thinking about different ways to make gears and cams and stuff just purely out of really lightweight kind of purely paper. Um, and then using these tiny stepper motors to, to move stuff around. Um, we then taught uh, a workshop again, it was like a year, like, I guess two years ago now, um, right kind of the summer before COVID, um, and explored that with a, with a group of people, which was really fun. It's a project that, um, I would really like to pick back up again. Cause I think there's so many possibilities there, um, for, you know, paper mechanics and paper me- mechanisms that are just incredibly delicate, um, and effective. Also, you can quite easily, I think, translate those or, or trans kind of transport them onto wearables and um kind of body worn things because they're so lightweight and um uh you know don't consume much power and all of those things so i think there's tons of potential there i've done a little and i'd love to do more so so how small are these yeah i mean they range so you can get um there's some pictures on my Instagram that show a collection, but some of them are really like the size of your pinky fingernail or something. Um, and then some of them are more like, I don't know, maybe the size of your thumb thumbnail or something, but these beautiful little motors, um, they're pretty awesome. I'm seeing some on Amazon that are about uh, three quarter inch by three quarter inch. No, much tinier. Okay. Um, I'll send you a link. Yeah. yeah, I need a link for that. The snails must crawl. Um, sorry. <laughs> what uh, are, are you putting together a library of these? Where, where can I find your mechanisms? Are they still in the research and development stage? Yeah, we, um, I'm trying to think, did we, we had a website and then I don't know what happened to it. It was kind of, we made it for this workshop and I, I would have to dig it up. Um, so the easiest answer is yes, they're still in like this R and D phase um, yeah, it was one of these things where COVID just everything went hay- haywire. And that was one of the threads that got lost, unfortunately, but it's good to talk because it's a reminder to pick it back up. Yes. Just pick it back up for me. I don't care about <laughs> anybody else just for me. Um, I should have asked you before, what's your favorite conductive thread? Oh gosh, that's a tricky one. Um, I would say I don't have a favorite. It all depends on your application and what you're wanting to do. I mean, just pure stainless steel is probably the best for straightforward stuff. Most importantly, it doesn't corrode. Um, 
Uh, and I like the one, uh, I'll get in trouble perhaps for saying this, but I like Ada Fruit's uh, uh, conductive stainless steel thread. Um, but but just the, the variety is great and different threads are good for different applications. Okay. I'll accept that. Um, but when you say stainless steel, it's still uh, plied. It's still multiple threads c- connected, right? It's not just one. Right. Okay. Right. So it, it really is like thread. It's like, uh, you know, hundreds of teeny tiny um, stainless steel wire that is spun into uh, a thread. Um, so it's it's soft and flexible like a traditional thread, but it's um, all of the little fibers that make up the thread are actually stainless steel. I wonder what the spindle looks like for that. Never mind. Um, okay, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just getting lost in the. Oh, I I totally understand. Yeah, you can go down rabbit holes of textile fabrication machines. Yeah, they're they're great. Yeah. When I looked at your site, you also had fabrics that not weren't printed, were had threads. Can you do you have any idea what I'm talking about? <laughs> You probably mean, so one of the projects we're working on is a collaboration with a civil, uh, a team of civil engineers here at UNM, which is looking at um, embedding kind of smart, like electronic textiles into composites um, for aerospace, but also just for civil engineering broadly. Um, And that is um, where we kind of fabricate these uh, circuits that are entirely fabric based. Um, so this is using some, of uh, some of the techniques I developed when I was in graduate school for making, um, laser cut, uh, textile circuits out of conductive fabric. So you can make really beautiful, precisely laid out, essentially printed circuit boards, but they're soft and flexible by laser cutting uh, conductive fabric in in a particular way. So we're using that to make these um, soft, flexible circuits, which then we um, embed in a composite. And it's very useful to have them be made out of textiles because the composite material can soak into the uh, electronics and it doesn't create like a problem with the integrity of the composite, really the textile, the electronics just kind of become like a hundred percent embedded in the composite because the textiles can just absorb the resin. Um, and then, um, we're experimenting with essentially composites that can sense their, their own shape. We're making these kind of custom sensors so that the composite can sense their shape and also kind of the stresses that they're under. So is it being bent in a certain way or is it being stretched in a certain way? Is it, is it about to break? Um, and then we're um, working with using shape memory alloys to be able to do something so the yeah, composite can say like, oh, <laughs> sorry. No, no. Uh, but so the composite can say like, oh, I'm being bent in this way that is going to break me. So I'm going to exert a force to like resist that bending and like go back to like a, a comfortable shape so I won't get broken. So that's that's the heart of that project. It was like you could also do like a closed feedback loop to okay, I want to go to this shape and no, I'm in it. Yeah, no, we can totally, no, we can, we can, um, get it, totally. We can get into a shape and then detect that we're in that shape. Or we can like, if we're being bent into that shape and we don't want to be there, um, try to bend back. Yeah, totally. I'm thinking of smart sail sailboats for some reason now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking of prosthetics. Well, yes. Okay. What, uh, when you say composite, what what does that mean? It's just a fancy way of saying like a combined materials that is in our case, what we're working right n- with right now is fiberglass and then a, a polyester resin. Okay. So we have layers of fiberglass and then we soak it with polyester and it to make this really hard, stiff, like structurally sound thing, but that has these embedded, um, you know, sensors and actuators in it. Would carbon fiber fall under that? category as well carbon fiber is um is is often used as the in place of um the fiberglass okay 
Um, the challenge with working with carbon fiber and why we've kind of skirted it a little bit for the short term is that it's conductive. Ah, okay. <laughs> so I didn't know that. Well, of course it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to like factor that into your design and there are ways I think that we can actually leverage the fact that it's conductive and it has these interesting electrical properties, but we haven't um, done that yet. We've kind of just used a non-conductive like uh, fiber to avoid that issue for the short term. Okay. So you make a circuit with a flexible fabric and then you put fiberglass around it to get something hard. Why didn't you just make a, a fiberglass PCB? That's what we do essentially. So we, okay. we um, there's like a sheet of fiberglass um, that is like the backing material for everything. The Then we have to like cut the textile circuit out of a copper fabric and then we adhere that to the fiberglass um then we're actually using um this um polymerization technique to to polymerize some of the fiberglass to turn it into um a sensor essentially and so then we integrate that into the circuit and it is actually the fiberglass um and then we put a bunch more layers of fiberglass so a single layer is just um not enough for the composite application. So we end up making these composites with like 20 layers or so of fiberglass. And one of those layers is the layer with the circuit. Okay. Christopher, do you have any more questions? I mean, if I keep clicking on different projects she has on her website, I'm, it's, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm just gonna keep asking questions. There's there's the one with the person, child in front of what looks like laser cut amazing curtains. Ah, uh, yeah, that's that's my son. That's a curtain in my house. Um, that's oh, it is a curtain. Kind of, okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's like just part of um, exploring computational design and fabrication. What are your? I guess this is kind of a weird question, but what are your tools that you predominantly use for for design? Like, are you living in like Fusion three hundred and sixty? Do you have custom things? I notice on your website you have something called. Slab Forge, so you're developing some of your own tools. Yeah, so that you know, that's all over the map, right? Right now, um, what we're exploring is writing a lot of Python code, and then okay. um, using that in Grasshopper and Rhino. Um, so that suite of tools, um, yeah. But but there are there are always like other tool sets to explore. Um, so, but for the computational design stuff, that's what we've been doing a lot of more lately. Well, I have to say that if I was in New Mexico, I would w be wanting to sign up for your research lab. There are so many things there and so many opportunities. It's just, there's a lot of fun. Um, but now we should probably let you get back to making these things instead of just talking to us. Do you have any thoughts you'd like to leave us with? I, I don't think so. I think that was, um, that was, that was, that was probably quite enough, but, um, I, I am, um, looking for graduate students. So if anybody is interested in, in spending several years playing, um, in the desert, um, yeah, check out my website and um, stop by for a visit. That would be lovely. If we're ever in New Mexico, I know where we have to stop. Yep. Our guest has been Professor Leah Beakley, Associate Professor in the Computer Science Department of the University of New Mexico, where she directs the Hand and Machine Research Group. Thanks. This is really interesting. Thank you so much. That was really fun. Thank you to Christopher for producing and co-hosting. Thank you for listening. You can always contact us at show at embedded.fm or hit the contact link on embedded.fm. And now a quote by Isaac Asimov. Actions such as his could only come from a robot or a very honorable and decent human being. But you see, you can't just differentiate between a robot and the very best of humans.